talked about on Wednesday is um, we started with the, the external components of the x-ray uh, apparatus and x-ray tube and uh, we talked about the, the different types of support systems so we talked about the external components and we talked about some of the internal components and that's where we're going to pick up today we we'll lit off those and uh, no good anymore so, um, external components, we talked about support systems, all the different types of support systems. The most common support system was uh, the type of two sets of rails, uh, four rails, two sets of rails in the ceiling. We talked about the other types as well. Floor mounted, floor to ceiling mounted, uh, C-arm system. Um, we talked about the protective housing. We talked about what it protects against. It's really two things. It's protection for you against uh, radiation and electrical shock, but also protection against you from rough handling as well. So it uh, it should limit the beam, should limit the radiation exposure uh, to the patient, and it should limit the leakage radiation, which would directly impact not only the patient but you as well. Um, we talked about what isotropic emissions are, and that is that uh, when we create x-rays, they go off in all different directions with equal intensity. Emission from the tube is not the same as uh, projection from the target. We'll talk about that as, as today goes on and also as the semester goes on. We talked about uh, what the, the purpose for the oil inside of the protective housing, uh, what it does for us, and that is that uh, primarily it's a thermal cushion, but it also is an electric insulator as well. We talked about the two different types of tubes we use, and the tube enclosure itself that provides and sustains that vacuum is what we call the envelope. And we talked about um, the two different types of those that we use, and that would be glass and metal. Um, and the, the benefits of metal we talked about that uh, as the tube aged, and we got the tanning, which is evaporation of the filament and possibly some melting, also evaporation of the, the uh, target as well. It comes inside the x-ray tube when we get tanning. Um, and that leads eventually to arcing. And we said that arcing was the most common cause for immediate tube failure. So if it's just instantaneous, your tube just quits working and there's no other reason for it, then most likely arcing. Um, we talked about uh, that tanning and what it does, and tanning is just um, a different layer of filtration. We've got two different types of filtration. Trent may have, have already walked through those. We've got um, inherent filtration and added filtration. For our purposes, what we're gonna call inherent filtration is, is everything that, that you have to have in place to, to legally, ethically, and safely make an x-ray, which is everything that we just talked about. Uh, all the way up to that 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. So the tanning is actually added inherent filtration because you can't take it away, right? So filtration doesn't stay the same over the, the life of the tube because of tanning. Then we talk, start talking about internal components. We talk about the cathode. We talk mainly about the filament and the filament being what we use to control sharpness or recorded detail. It's our source of thermonic emissions. It's the negative end of the x-ray tube. Um, so it's the negative uh, uh, diode. It's the, the negative end, the, the negative uh, portion. So it's the source of electrons, source of thermonic emissions. Um, we said that the current is always present through the cathode end of the x-ray tube. And it just keeps the tube warm so that we don't have a lot of heat applied to something that's cold and immediately breaking. Uh, we talked about the focusing cup, and the focusing cup surrounds the filament. That's not all the way around the filament, but it, it's on, uh, you know, basically four sides. Uh, and I'll pass this around in a minute. And the focusing cup, we talked about the purpose for the focusing cup, and that is to just kind of cram the electrons together so that we focus the stream of electrons to the portion of the anode that we want. Um, to, to strike with them and, and where we want to create x-rays. Uh, so 
it compresses a stream of electrons. Uh, the uh, space charge that focuses the exposure to the focal track because they tend to spread out because they're all negative charges. We talked about what blooming of the space charge was and how the focusing stuff helps for that. It uh, compresses them and it, it keeps them confined to a degree. Uh, blooming, um, I'm not sure that we, we completely finished blooming, but uh, blooming can occur anyway, even with the presence of focusing cup. If we have extremely high MA exposures or if you stand on the, the um, um, prep button for too long and you overheat the, the filament, you can still create blooming and blooming decreases sharpness of reported detail. So the, the purpose for the focusing cup is to improve sharpness of reported detail, but if you've got blooming present, either because you're just uh, holding on to the prep button for too long, um, you're not only overheating your tube, but you're also causing some blooming, or if you use very high and late, um, it decreases sharpness of reported detail. So uh, before we press on, any questions on all of that? I have a question. Sure. So why is it that working happens with metal, or with glass and not metal? Like why? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a good question, and it's, uh, it, it happens with glass because with the glass, you, you've changed the uh, conductivity of the glass itself. It went from an insulator to a, uh, a conductor, right? So it's gone from an insulator to a conductor, and if that distance between the filament, and this is just my opinion, really, I, I don't know the intricacies oh. of the build of the, the, the enclosure itself, but if, if that distance is small enough, then it can ignore the, the travel from the cathode to the anode, and it may just go to the, to the tanning on the glass. As opposed to a metal construction, I think that, that what they've done is they've increased the distance between uh, the, the metal tube itself and that filament, and remembering that uh, electricity follows the path of least resistance. So if it's got a choice to go that far, or a choice to go that far, it's gonna go that far. So laying down that, that extra little bit of, um, of metal on top of metal, isn't really gonna change the, the conductivity of the tube at all. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, but with glass, why wouldn't they change the distance there also? That's a good question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't I think that they're, uh, they're probably moving towards metal enclosures. Um, just to, if if everything you know if, if they took the glass tubes and made them you know bigger and, and everything then you know they're gonna have to make the enclosures bigger and, and yeah. you know why not just make that a metal at that point so uh, that's just my personal opinion so okay. there's no you know facts behind that that's just my personal opinion so we mainly just need to know that with glass it's gonna yeah, the, okay. the, the likelihood of an arcing event is going to be greater with a glass tube after tanning is laid down than with a metal tube. If they can overcome in the engineering of the tube and creation of the tube the tendency to create that arcing, then laying down that, that little bit of extra metal it really doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But if you have an insulator and you put um, you know, a conductor on top of that, then you know, you've, you've changed the entire uh, electric potential of the to itself. So, and, uh, the only way I, I can imagine that they could overcome that is by making that distance greater. Oh. So, that's why I say this, that's you know, how I figure it happens. Alright, so uh, there's some diagrams that we're going to refer to on the focusing cup, and I'm also going to pass around um, a cathode and an anode and an x-ray tube, but what, uh, what I'm going to be referring to and what will be helpful to, uh, to kind of visualize and imagine are the diagrams on page 107, then both of the two at the top on 108, and then top right on 109. All right, so the focusing cup, um, we, we talked about the fo focusing cup. The focusing cup is this portion right here. All right, so you, I'm going to pass this around. What you should see are two filaments inside of the focusing cup. Now, almost every x-ray tube is going to have two. It's going to have a large and a small. And the purpose for the tube is for high heat load, 
you're making big exposures, you want to use the big one. And if you're looking for sharpness or reported detail for reasons we'll talk about here in a bit, you want to use the small one. Okay? So what you'll notice on these, and we'll refer to actual focal spot sizes, this is not your focal spot. This is what you use to control your focal spot. Okay, this is just filament size. Focal spot is a product of two different things, and that is the area of bombardment on the x-ray tube, uh, which is controlled by this, and the angulation of that, uh, the anode itself. So the target ang angulation plus the stream of electrons that strike it are what give you your, your actual focal spot. So the focal spot isn't the anode, or on the cathode itself, it's on the anode. It's an actual area of bombardment on the, the anode. And we've actually got two different things when we refer to focal spot. We've got the actual focal spot, which is the actual area of bombardment, and then we've got the projected focal spot or the effective focal spot. So the projected and effective focal spot are the same thing. We'll talk more about that as well. I'm going to pass this around and take a look at that. So um, the, the filaments themselves are, are made of tungsten. And the book points out that tungsten has a high uh, melting point. It, it tolerates heat well. You do eventually burn it out, but it's, it's going to take a lot of heat before it burns out. So 3,410 degrees Celsius, which is just a ridiculous number in, in Fahrenheit, before it's, it's just going to melt. Um, that doesn't mean that you know, as you heat it up, you don't have just a little bit coming off of every exposure, but in order to completely burn it out in a single exposure, you would have to heat it up to 30, you know, 3211, 3211 degrees Celsius in order to burn it up in a single exposure. So it withstands a whole lot of heat. But also, what the book doesn't point out is that tungsten is unique in metals and in, in materials in particular, metals in particular, materials in, uh, in general. So you heat something up and what happens to it in a lot of cases? With the exception of water, you heat it up, well, no, well, water included. You heat it up and what happens? It expands, right? You blow a balloon up you fill it with your breath and you stick it in the refrigerator. Um, and if you've never done this or never seen it, then you know you can do this little experiment at home. You blow it up and you stick it in the refrigerator. What's going to happen is that balloon is going to contract. It's going to get a little big. So you take it out of the refrigerator and you let it heat back up and it will expand again. Okay, so things tend to expand whenever they get hot and they tend to contract whenever they get cold. Tungsten doesn't do that. Uh, tungsten maintains its shape regardless of how hot or cold it gets. So the significance of that is that you, you see this as it goes around, and what you've got is a coil of wire, and the coil of wire is very straight, right? If we had a type of, of metal that did not um, maintain its shape as it heated up, if it warped as it got hot, then we'd have all kinds of imaging issues, okay? So what we have in our sharpness of reported detail and, and how we get a, a, as sharp an image as possible is by using as small a filament as we can possibly use. You know, this is after we've got a low OID and an adequate SID. But we use as small a filament as possible. We keep the stream of electrons confined to a, a particular place on the anode itself and then we get a projected focal spot. You see the difference between these two. This is an actual focal spot, and this is a projected focal spot. You see the difference between those two? One's relatively big and one's relatively small. Now imagine if we used a metal type that distorted whenever it got hot. What would happen? You know, the electrons, first off, will probably are going to exceed where the focusing cup's going to be, right? Which means that, you know, these electrons are, are going to be escaping from a larger area and striking a different area on the anode, creating a larger projected focal spot and decreasing sharpness for reported detail. Tungsten doesn't do that. It maintains its shape 
no matter how hot it gets until it gets to the point of burnout. Okay. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's important to have a high heat mode, but it's also important to have this as well. And the book just doesn't, doesn't touch on that. So uh, thorium is added at about one to two percent thorium in order to, to do a couple of things. First off, tungsten is good for thermonic emissions. It's not ideal, but it's good. Um, the thorium increases thermonic emissions, that's number one. And number two, though, is that it also increases, and again, the book didn't point this out, but it also increases the strength of the filament. The other sneaky thing about tungsten is it's brittle. It's very, very brittle. Anybody own a, like a tungsten ring? Or know anybody that owns a tungsten ring? It became very popular a few years ago. Okay, um, so the, the, the issue that a lot of people have with a tungsten ring is that, you know, you take it off and you drop it and it has a tendency to shatter. If it's truly solid tungsten, it will shatter. I had a student one year that, um, you know, she, in high school, was an ag, and somebody knocked over, you know, like a, um, a welding cart that, that had a wire feed that it was, it was all tungsten. It was like a $500 roll of of wire and they knocked the cart over and it just shattered like glass. It was all over the shop floor. Uh, very, very brittle. So um, to not only increase the thermionic emission properties of the tungsten, it also adds some stability. And when we get to the target, the target is mainly tungsten as well for some of the same reasons, but it's also alloyed too. And the alloy in the, the target is usually uh, rhenium for the same reasons, and that is that tungsten is brittle and pure tungsten uh, would probably shatter if there was some rough handling and that sort of thing. So, uh, thorium added for thermonic emissions to increase thermonic emissions, but also to give some strength to the filament itself. So the filament sizes, a reason I point out the filament is not the focal spot at this point is because the filament sizes are usually one to two centimeters long, so they're relatively large. Uh, when we talk about focal spot, we're gonna be talking about in small focal spot anyway, down to fractional sizes, 0.1 millimeters in some cases, uh, very, very small. Um, and your large focal spot is probably not gonna be much larger than 1.2 or 1.5 millimeters. Okay, so we've gone from centimeters, two centimeters, almost an inch. So we've gone from almost an inch to down to a fraction of a centimeter. Okay, so uh, what we've got there is the difference between the, the projected focal spot, which is what we call our effective focal spot, and the actual focal spot, which is the actual area of bombardment on the target itself. It's also important to understand that the entire anode is not the target. The target is just the focal track around the outside of the anode where x-rays are created. Okay, so x-rays are created on the focal track and are projected because of the ang angulation of the target would get a, an effective focal spot that's much, much smaller than the actual focal spot. Actual focal spot is very similar to the size of the filament itself projected focal spot is significantly smaller, a little bit. Okay. So when you select your focal spot size, though, what you are selecting is the filament size. So you got a large filament and you got a small filament. Small filaments usually roughly half the size of the, the large filament. So if in selecting the small filament, we we limit the number of electrons that we can create to just this area right here, then we strike a smaller portion of the anode and our projected focal spot is smaller, right? So in that way, that's how we control the focal spot size is with filament size. Smaller filament, smaller area of impact on the anode, smaller projected or effective, effective focal spot. So we control our focal spot with filament size 
our actual focal spot is this, and our effective focal spot is that. The difference between the actual and effective focal spot is what we call the line focus, focus principle. Now what the line focus principle says is that we can use a relatively large area of bombardment, that is our actual focal spot, and because the angulation of that anode, we can project a very much smaller projected or effective focal spot. So the difference between those two is the line focus principle. Now, why would we do that? Well, for a lot of different reasons. The one that's pointed out in the book is because we can just do that. We can use a, a relatively large filament and create a, a relatively small projected focal spot. But really, how else are we going to do this? You know, um, if we were to put the filament here, and even if we used a tiny filament and we shot our, our stream of electrons up that way in order to, to image the patient down here, then what we're going to have is x-ray creation coming right back through the filament in order to create x-rays. And what we're going to see on every x-ray image is the filament itself. We have to do this. You know, it, it, it seems, seems like it's pointed out that, that the line focus principle is this magical thing that somebody came up with, and it's really not. It's, this is the way we have to do it. Now we can control the, the, the size of this uh, by changing the anode angle. If we use a very shallow anode angle, then what we get is a projective focal spot that's really big, right? So if this really controls our sharpness for reported detail, we're going to have lower sharpness for reported detail if we had this thing at that weird angle, okay? So anyway, that's a diversion. Um, so when we select a focal spot, what we're actually selecting is the size of the filament. The size of the filament controls our projected focal spot, our effective focal spot and sharpness for reported detail. Now, when we send electrons through a conductor, what do we create? Two things. Electricity and a magnetic field, but in the travel of those electrons, what do we create? Heat. Heat, right. So you look at these two things and uh, thinking about the, the laws of electrodynamics and, and you know the resistance and everything, the, the more electrons that we put on either one of these, what am I going to create more of? Tanning. Heat and, and eventually tanning, right? And tanning eventually is going to lead to, to failure, right? So we, we, we want to avoid that as, as much as possible. So which one of these two is going to be able to accumulate more electrons um, safer for the x-ray tube before we get to tanning, before we get to a burnout of a filament? Which one can sustain more heat, do you think? Smaller. The bigger one. The bigger one. You put more electrons on that great big one, right? If you took the same number of electrons, if you put the maximum number of electrons on this big one, knowing that electrons cause heat, and you put all of that on that smaller one, you're going to burn up the smaller one a whole lot faster, right? So when you make an exposure um, and you select a focal spot size, then um, what your machine is going to do is it's going to, there's safeguards in place so that you can't make too big of an exposure on a small focus spot, all right? So most of your machines, most of the machines, I know the book says 300 MA and lower, you should be able to make on both filaments. I've not seen that so much. Uh, most of the machines I've worked on, you can't select a small filament on anything above 200 mA. Okay, so that's just most of the ones, that's my experience, most of the machines I've worked on, you couldn't select anything on the small filament at an MA station of 200 mA or above 200 mA. What you would get if you tried to select 400 mA on a small filament size, you know, you turn your photo timers off and you turn your, your automatic exposure, you know, your uh, what they call APR, it's automatic, automatically programmed radiography. 
So instead of punching chest x-ray, you turn all that off and you select your KVP, you select your MA, and you select your time. You select 400 MA on small filament, and what you're going to get is two bulk load. It won't let you do it. Won't let you do it. You switch over to a large filament, and it will allow that. And it's a safeguard to keep you from burning up the x-ray tube too early. Okay? It doesn't want you to put a whole lot of electrons on a little bit of filament and burn it up. All right? So um, you can make an exposure. Let's say you, you do use small filament for a lot of exposures. Uh, let's say large filament. Let's say you use large filament, filament a lot and you break it. You burn it out. Can you still use that x-ray tube? Yeah, absolutely you can. All you got to do is select small filament, and all of your exposures at that point have to be limited exposures, right? So let's say you know you make an exposure, you try to make an exposure on a large focal spot, and it's a reasonable exposure. Let's say you know 70 kVp at 20 mass. Uh, let's say the 20 mass comes with 200 ma. If it doesn't let you do it on a large focal spot. You switch to small focal spot and it lets you, you've done nothing else, and it lets you make that exposure. You know, you put it on large focal spot and it gives you tube overload. You put it on small focal spot and it gives you an exposure. You got to burn out filament. And the reverse is true as well. If, you know, you, you set a hand technique on small filament and it won't let you, you know, you, you've got a tube overload light and then you switch over to large filament and you can make that exposure. You've got to burn out small filament. Okay? So you can still make an exposure. And the purpose for the two filaments is not a backup. That's not the point to it at all. The purpose for the two filaments is big exposures, sharpness of reported detail. That's it. Okay? If, if one was provided for a backup, you'd have two filaments exactly the same size. You don't have that. You've got two filaments, one so that you can put high heat load, big exposures, and another is if you're looking for sharpness recorded detail. Okay? So, again, your focal spot is a product of the filament size of the anode angle. Um, any questions on the anode or the, the cathode end of the X-ray tube? The different components of the cathode end of the X-ray tube, purpose for large, small filament, focusing cup, blooming. Oh, uh, couple of things. Um, in the book, you got a couple of terms that, that seem in a lot of ways like they're, they're the same thing, but they're not really. Um, let me see if I can find them. You've got all right, space charge effect, saturation current. Okay. So um, regardless of what focal size, what spot size you're using, whichever filament you're using, large or small, you can only put so many electrons on that thing, okay? Even if you get to the point where you've got blooming, you can only put so many electrons on the filament, right? Because electrons are all negative, so they're gonna be trying to push each other apart. Um, but it, in the, the focusing cup's gonna be trying to cram those back together, and you're gonna get to a point of uh, critical mass, basically. You know, it's kind of like raking leaves. You put leaves in a bag, right? You compress them down, you compress them down, you compress them down. Can you compress them forever? No, you can't. Sooner or later, that bag's going to be too full to compress anymore. Okay, that's what you've got going on there with what we call the space charge effect. Okay, at that point, do you have tube current? Tube current defined as current that goes all the way through the tube. No, you've got filament current. You haven't, you're still in prep stage, right? You've, you haven't pressed exposure. You don't get tube current until the electrons travel from cathode to anode. When does that happen? When you make the exposure. Yeah, you change the, the uh, uh, relative charges on the x-ray tube, so during prep, you know, you've just got so much negative charge, so much positive charge. During exposure, you increase positive charge and jump across, right? And 
increase the potential difference across the two of them they jump across. So the space charge effect is just during prep uh, and it's the maximum number of electrons you can have available to send across the two. Now when you make your exposure, so you hit the, the expose button, where are those electrons going to go? Right, they're going to go across the tube. So what happens to the electrons on the anode? Those ones that you had stored during prep. They're over here now, right? They're over here, they travel across the tube, so what do you got on the anode? Space for more electrons, right? So as soon as they jump across, you got space for more electrons, so maybe you're making a, a half second exposure. And what's happening during that half second exposure is that you're evacuating this thing and putting them over here constantly throughout that half second exposure. So you're, you're making room for more electrons. Now, is there a point that you get to where you can't supply, you, you set a technique that's so high that you can't supply enough electrons to fully stock this thing before sending them across? And the answer is yes. And that's what you call saturation. Saturation current is during tube current, you can't supply enough electrons to, to continue to, to make enough electrons to send across the tube at the rate that you want them to go. It's the highest possible exposure you can make. So really, space charge effect is the highest prep you can make, whereas saturation current is the highest tube current you can create, creating extra. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. All right, so the other end of the x-ray tube, we get the anode. Anode is the entire assembly from the disc all the way back through the stem, and that's the ugliest anode I've ever drawn. It is the positive end of the x-ray tube. All right, so the whole thing is your anode. And you've actually got one portion that is not inside of the x-ray tube. The x-ray tube is the portion that's inside of the, the envelope. So this is the x-ray tube itself. But you've got one portion that you consider to be a portion of the x-ray tube that's not really inside the glass. So sooner or later, you're going to run into some questions or a question that will ask you, uh, what's the only portion of the x-ray tube that's outside of the envelope? And that is your induction tube. Okay. I brought two different things, and I'm going to pass this one around. This is an in induction motor actually out of an x-ray tube. So induction, what is induction? Okay, so it, it has to do with electrons that create something else. And what we've got here is electromagnetic induction. You send electrons down a, a circuit or a charged particle in, in motion creates a magnetic field, exactly. So we can control where those electrons are gonna go, a charged particle is gonna go, if we give it a conductor, right? So what is copper? It's a really good conductor. Copper looks like that, right? It's kind of red orange. All right, so what we've got here is a, uh, a series of diversions for the copper to go through. So what I want you to look at as, as this comes around is you got these copper coils. So if we run current through these things, plug this into the current, um, it's going to create magnetic field. But what you're going to see is that it acts as if it has individual little bitty uh, magnets. Okay, so we create magnetic field whenever we have a charged particle in motion, but if we separate those magnetic fields, we can make them as if they're individual magnets. Okay? So this is also an induction motor, but this is out of a washing machine. Okay? Um, I don't know that they make this kind of washing machine anymore, uh, but the, the reason I bring this is because it's a little bit easier to see how each individual portion would be more like a magnet. I'm not going to pass this one around because it's kind of dirty. Um, 
but uh, you, you can kind of see how each one of these would be kind of like a, an individual electromagnet, right? So our anode into the x-ray tube is not just the target, it's not just the disc, and it's not just the stem, but it's also the portion outside of the tube and in, in the induction motor. So all of these individual components make up our anode. So what's the purpose for the anode? A lot of things. Uh, creation of x-ray is number one, right? We can have an anode that doesn't have an induction motor and it doesn't turn. That's what we call a stationary anode. You don't see those very often. Very limited exposure machines, dental units. Um, I've only seen a uh, stationary anode diagnostic x-ray machine one time. Um, and it was an old, old portable unit and the entire tube head was about the size of a mason jar, about the size of my coffee cup. It was a little bitty thing. And it didn't have a prep button, it just had an exposure. It didn't have a rotating anode. It just, you just made exposure. So, um, you just, you're, you're not gonna see those. Uh, I would be surprised if you made it all the way through your career and you even saw a single stationary anode unit. You're gonna be working with a, a rotating anode. So that's what we're gonna focus on. So, what does it do? Well, it creates x-rays, that's number one. Um, it has to dissipate heat, too. What's the main thing we create an x-ray to? Heat. heat, right. So we have to do something with it because what's the number one thing that's gonna destroy x-ray to? Heat. heat, right. So we have to do something with it. What are the three ways that we dissipate heat? Convection, convection. convection and Convection, conduction, and, and thermal radiation, right. So we're gonna use all three of those to get rid of some of that heat. Um, in the anode itself, what we're gonna use is conduction. All right, so, pass this around as well. This is an actual anode out of an x-ray tube. So what you'll notice about it is, you know, it's got a thing sticking off the back and it actually got broken off. Um, you've got some divots into the back of it, and that's just to balance it. Um, I didn't bring an actual x-ray tube down because I had already had arm, double arm load. Um, but what you'll notice is it's got a flat spot, and then it's got this bevel on it. Okay, the bevel is actually the, the um, what we call the focal track. It's where the x-rays are created. Okay, so it's tungsten with a you know, little bit of rhenium in it. Uh, try not to drop it. It probably won't break if you do, but it very well might, so try not to drop it. Okay. So, what we have in the disc face, the face of the disc, is we've got a relatively large area. Remember that our focal spot size is going to be very small because of the line of focus principle, right? The, the focal spot, the effective focal spot, is what you would see if you were looking, you know, you, you were the patient on the table and you were looking up at the x-ray tube. And basically what we've got is, you see the pin, you see the length of the pin, right? And it's, what, maybe three and a half inches long. And if I turn it like that, how long does it look? Shorter. Shorter, right. So your eyes then are, are getting a kind of an idea of, of what the, the projected focal spot or the effective focal spot kind of looks like. So the, the actual area of bombardment is the focal track. It's relatively large, um, but it's still kind of kind of small in comparison to the size of the disc. Okay? So at any given point on this particular drawing, your point of impact may be that large. Okay? So we've got Conduction, convection, thermal radiation. Uh, thermal radiation, the, the heat leaves everything, it goes to the glass and it gets conducted into the, into the oil. But, say you're cooking on a stove top or you're camping or whatever and you've got a cast iron skillet. So it's got a metal handle. Anybody ever done this? Okay. So if you just put the very edge of the cast iron skillet over the fire, does the handle down here, this suddenly is not an anode, but it's a cast iron skillet, does the handle get hot? Not bad, not real bad, right? 
So the heat is primarily going to be over there. But the handle is not too bad. If you put the whole thing over it, does it get hot? Yeah, you better not touch it, right? Now, if your cast iron skillet was somehow magically able to rotate, but the handle remained the same, and you put the fire just over the edge of it out here, then is the entire thing going to heat up? Yeah, maybe slower, right? And there's your key. It might heat up, but it's going to be slower. So if, if you're trying to heat something up, but you're not trying to overheat it, then would that be a better alternative than putting the whole cast iron skillet over, over the fire? The answer is yes. Right. So what's the main thing that's going to pair up your tube? Heat. Heat. Right. So what are we trying to do? Dissipate it. Dissipate it, spread it out. Right. So if, now we're back to a, an anode, if we put all of our heat load into one spot and the anode is not rotating, then what's the heat load on that one spot? It's quite hot, right? But if I were to take this whole thing and spin it around and around, even if I moved it slowly, would I not take all that heat that's created here and deposited there and spread it out over a larger area? And the answer is yes, okay? So the heat's gonna spread out. As the heat is spreading out, that's not conduction, right? That's just rotation. But as the heat is spreading out, Again, back to our cast iron skillet, is this going to be really cold? Yeah. No, it's going to heat up. It's just not going to be too hot if the fire is way away from it, right? So why did the, the handle get hot if it wasn't directly over the fire? From the heat. Yeah. Conduction, just because of conduction, right? So if we didn't rotate the anode, would the whole anode get hot? Yeah, yeah because of conduction. But would this portion of the anode get as hot as that portion of the anode? The answer is no. So, if we rotate it, we spread out that heat, and the heat is absorbed by the whole thing as opposed to one little bitty portion. So the heat spreads out. Heat spreads out through conduction. Okay? So by rotating the anode, what we do is we take all that heat that's concentrated in one place, and we spread it out over a much, much larger area. Okay? Through both conduction and through the, the rotation of, the, of the, um, the anode. So when does rotation of the anode begin? Whenever you rotate it. Whenever you rotate it. So what happens when you rotate it? You get rotation of the anode. What else do you get? That, right? What's that create? Heat. Is that the heat created there going to affect this thing? will not extensively yet but it will right because well what do we have we've got we're talking about conduction convection. what do we have convection. not convection yeah, convection is the movement of air particles it's a, it's a vacuum tube oh. so it's thermal radiation so is heat getting over here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes absolutely also whenever you hit your your prep button the way this thing works is that what you've got you got anode stem, and then you've got on the outside, you've got the, uh, the electromagnets. I'm just gonna draw individual you know, electromagnets. What you've got is these things fire in order. So you got some sort of, of uh, ferromagnetic material inside of the anode. You push your prep button, and what happens is that these fire in order. So let's say we turn this one on, what's gonna happen with that strip? have a tendency to go that way. If we turn it off and we turn this one on, then it's going to continue to go. When I turn it off and I turn this one on, it's going to continue to go and so forth. So what we get during prep stage is we get a uh, increase in current to the filament which creates our space charge. Right? Now two space charge effect we just create a space charge which is thermionic emission. So if we create that in doing so, we'll create heat, right? At the same time, we'll get rotation of the anode because what we have is firing of the electromagnets in a specific sequence to pull that rotor around and it accelerates from zero to 3,000 RPMs in a matter, RPM, in a matter of one second.
right? So you mash the prep button. Can you make an exposure as soon as you mash the prep button? No. no. If you just hit prep button, you're still going to have one second wait because it's going to rotor up as to prevent you from putting a high heat load on a single spot on the anode. So even if you walked into the room and pushed prep, if, if you're working on a system that had two, two buttons, you know, one prep and, and one uh, expose, if you walked in and you hit expose, I said prep, but I meant expose, if you hit expose, you're not gonna make an exposure for one second because it's trying to rotor up, okay? So it goes from zero to 3,000 RPMs in one second, okay? Um, let's see, have you ever touched something that's been rotating for a long time? Yeah, what do you feel? It will burn you. Um, you know, you drive to school, you get out, you reach in and you, you know, poke the, the hub of, of your wheel and it's hot, right? So these, the, the rotor has to rotate on something. It's a rotor because it rotates. It has to rotate on something. It rotates on ball bearings, right? So with the ball bearings, even though we're really, really well balanced and you got these bearings that it rotates on very, very easily, there's still friction going on there. Anytime you got friction, what do you, what do you get? Heat. Heat, right. So when you prep, you create Space charge, which also gives you a lot of thermonic emissions. First part of that being heat. You get heat. We rotate that, we get a lot of friction, which creates heat. All right, so we got heat going in two different, two different ways. Before we ever make our exposure, this thing's getting hot. Right? What's the main thing kills you too? Heat. Heat. Right. All right. So now back to this. We send the electrons across the tube and they uh, strike the focal track just in a single spot that's rotating at a very high speed so that we spread out the heat, right? The reason that we use tungsten for the focal track, the entire anode might not be made of tungsten, the one I passed around is, but the entire anode face of the disc might not be made of tungsten. It may just be the focal track that's tungsten. Uh, the rest of it may be a composite of a number of different things. Uh, it may be rhenium, uh, molybdenum, maybe a number of different things. All of which, with the exception of graphite, and, and a, again, the book, book didn't really point this out, but the graphite is not a good heat conductor. All right? Everything else is, and we want it to be a good heat conductor because we want the heat to go all over and spread out so that we don't have a high heat load to just a single spot. But when we send these things across the tube, these are hot electrons, so we've got thermionic emissions, right? Mm -hmm. So they come across the tube, but they're gonna lose their heat in the travel across the tube during exposure. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. So we're gonna create hot ions, we're gonna deliver hot ions to this thing we've already started to heat up, okay? Now, <clears throat> you ever pulled up next to a car that's, um, you know, pulling up to the to the uh, red light and it's making this horrific grinding sound. Okay, you got one of two things going on there. Either somebody's got some bad brakes and they just need a brake job, or they've got bad wheel bearings. So the wheels in your car also have bearings that they ride on. All right, if the car takes off from the red light and it's not making that horrible sound anymore, it's, it's probably brakes, but if it's still making that sound as it drives away, the bearings are going, going to go out. Because of the heat in your car as you drive down a road, your bearings eventually wear out. Um, it, it may take it 100,000 miles to do so, but eventually wheel bearings are going to fail. These are going to fail too, for the same reason. you got friction, but you've also got compounding issues as well. Create heat, deposit heat, create heat, transmit heat, conduct heat down this thing, and it makes it worse, right? Does that kind of make sense? So we want to take all this heat that's created here and deposited there 
and we want to spread it out over this, but we want to keep it from coming down that the best we can. Will we prevent all of it? No, but we want to try to prevent as much as possible. So some of your x-ray tubes might have a graphite backing. And the graphite is actually a, a pretty poor conductor of heat. The purpose for the graphite backing is to keep the heat on the anode face itself so that we don't conduct it down and heat our bearings up and wind up destroying our bearings. So you walk into your x-ray room, you press the prep button, what should happen? Should get rotation, right? These fire in sequence to rotate and accelerate the anode from zero to 3,000 RPM in one second. And at the same time, you create thermonic emission and creation of space charge. Now you hear a grinding sound. What do you suppose that is? The ball bearings melting. You got bad bearings. Yeah. Eventually, what that's going to lead to is they will stop. You know, that's that's just a verbal clue that that you've got a an audible clue that you've got a problem with with your X-ray tube. You might still be able to get away with with making exposures on that for months, <coughs> but eventually they're going to stop. When they do stop. Then what's going to happen is you've got a stationary anode. So all of that heat's going to be deposited in one spot. You don't get rotation. You're going to get deposited all in one spot so that eventually what's going to happen is you melt your anode. Okay? So we create heat, we deposit heat, we spread out heat, we stop the heat from going down that way the best we can. Can't do all of it. It's still going to be an issue. Uh, bad bearings is still going to be an issue. All right, so would it be good to make your exposure and just let this thing spin forever? No. No. Why? Because, again, we're back to friction. So what we want to do eventually is to reverse fire these things if, if they went to, to accelerate to 3,000 RPM in clockwise fashion, then what's going to happen is these are going to fire in a reverse order and uh, reverse the, the, uh, the magnetic sequence so that it will take it from 3,000 RPMs down to zero within one minute. Uh, and that's really extreme. Um, I've never worked with a, with a tube that took that long for the anode to stop. Usually five, six, seven seconds and you'll hear it. You know, you make your exposure and it goes, and it's done. Okay? So, what are the, the other means that we can deal with the heat on the anode itself? Well, if rotating it that fast was good, then would rotating it faster be better? Yeah. Yeah. You could dissipate heat a little bit better by rotating it faster. Uh, some of your special procedures tubes and CT tubes will rotate up to 10,000 RPM. So they're really, really fast. Um, if we used a, an anode that was larger, would that help? Yeah. Certainly. We've got much more area to spread the heat out in. Uh, if we design the, the housing so that uh, convection was more efficient and it removed more of the heat from the oil and therefore removed heat from the x-ray tube, would that be a, a help? Yeah. yeah, certainly. So a lot of different things can be done to improve uh, the heat dissipation in the, in the uh, x-ray tube and in the housing itself. Okay? Any questions on all that? I have a question. Yeah. Um, where is the induction motor located? Good question. The induction motor are, is, is this, and it's actually outside of the x-ray tube but it's still considered a portion of the x-ray tube. So it's inside of the housing, but outside of the x-ray tube. So like, can you point it out like on that graph where it would kind of be, or? <laughs> yeah, it, it would be like wrapped around this thing right here. Outside of the glass, wrapped around the glass. So it would be just kind of going across there, okay. surrounding it. So, um, and well, if, if this was, was that set right there, the x-ray tube itself would go straight to that. And that's, is that 
that's not what rotates, right? Like the no. magnets? No, no, okay. no. The, what rotates is, is on the inside of the x-ray tube. The x-ray tube itself doesn't rotate. It's what's on the inside yeah. of the x-ray tube, this portion right there. I got confused because you pointed at that, the anode stem and the magnets, and so I was like, wait. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I uh, got you now. Yeah. Now, th this is inside of the x-ray tube. This is on the outside of the x-ray tube. Okay. Yeah. So this is supposed to be as if you're looking down on that. Mm -hmm. And okay. that's the anode stem. Yeah. These are also called, you, the, this entire assembly is called a rota rotor because it rotates, right? And the, the electromagnets, the induction motor, is called a stator because it's stationary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, um, again, you know, watch for this because you, you're going to have a tendency to think, well, it's part of the x-ray because it's inside of the, the uh, in, inside of the um, envelope. But, uh, you'll watch for the, the question that, that says the only portion of the x-ray tube that's outside of the envelope is the induction, induction motor, which is also in the state. Right? Yeah. Can you say the graphite backing is a for what? Uh, conductor of heat. The, the, the entire anode assembly has, a, has to be a good conductor of electricity because it's positive into the x-ray tube and that's going to complete the circuit. But this portion specifically, all this needs to be a good conductor of heat. This portion specifically needs to be a bad conductor of heat. Just to keep the, the heat out here and off of those. As best I can. So, since my camera's up there, I don't, I don't know what time it is. What? Yes, 10.35. Okay. Uh, hopefully I can get through it. Um, so the anode's positive into the x-ray tube, um, it's positive electrode, it's electrical conductor, it's mechanical support for the target itself. Remembering that the entire thing is not the target. The target is just the area of impact that is your focal track. Because where the x-rays are actually created is the target itself. The entire thing is not the focal track. Um, it's where we create the x-rays. It has to be a good uh, thermal dissipator. Uh, it can be copper, molybdenum, uh, tungsten is what we use for the target itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So why do we use tungsten? Um, three reasons, really. Uh, heat, conduction, heat dissipation, thermal load, all of that is one. But a big portion of it, and that's, that's a huge portion of it, actually. But another big portion of it is atomic number. Okay. So how do we create x-rays? This goes all the way back to the very first lecture. How do we create x-rays? It's, it's always fun. The breaking of the knife. Okay. No. No. Okay. How do we, what are the two ways we create x-rays? Characteristic. Brims and characteristic. Right. So how does brims work? It's like it slows down. Slows down. Right. So BREMS, short for BREMS for a long, is breaking radiation. So we use the solar system model. Uh, what you've got here are positive and neutral charges, and what you're going to shoot at it are electrons. And we use the, the solar system model saying that, that the nucleus is kind of like the sun, right? And the, the orbital electrons are kind of like planets. And then these were the, the electrons we shoot at it. The projectile electrons are kind of like comets and stuff like that, right? So it gets a comet gets close to the sun, and what happens to it? It slows down. It slows down. You got mutual attraction there. It slows down. It changes directions. Halley's comet comes around every seventy-eight years or something like that. It's got a very elliptical orbit because of the gravitational pull of the sun. It's going to come around and around, right? So what you've got is that gravitational pull that takes those electrons and changes their direction. And because of the loss of energy and the, uh, the laws of conservation of energy, the energy has to go somewhere. And where it goes is in the x-ray, the, the, the um, form of x-ray photon. Okay. So what if our nucleus, or our sun, so to speak, wasn't that big and that dense and that heavy, and instead it was the big. 
bingo, wouldn't have that much of a gravitational pull. So what would be the effect on the breaking of the slowing down of that photon, or that electron? Not as much. So what would be the energy of that photon? Very low. It wouldn't be as much, right? So the size of the nucleus of the atom has everything to do with how effective we're going to create Brim's uh, X-ray photons and um, the, the energy level that we'll be able to, to accomplish in creation of those Brim's photons. Okay? So big target that we're shooting at. Big target, easier to get close to, and we can create a lot of, uh, relatively a lot of, of X-ray photons with Brim's target. All right, so what determines atomic number? Number of protons, exactly. So we got a number of protons. So we got a lot of protons, um, and in an electrically neutral atom, you're going to have the same number of protons as you have electrons. electrons, right? So if we have a lot of protons, giving us a big nucleus, then we're also going to have a lot of electrons, electrons right? So what's the other way that we create it? Characteristic. All right, so we got electrons traveling around the outside, and if this electron, the projectile electron, hits an orbital electron, knocks it out of place, it goes off in a different direction, and then we get an X-ray photon created as well. All right, so why do we call it characteristic X-rays? Because they're so much of characteristics. Of? Right. <laughs> <laughs> characteristics of the tungsten atom. Right? Because that binding energy between this electron and that nucleus is going to be specific to the atom type that we're using. So if that wasn't tungsten, if it was a different element, then that binding energy would be different. Right? But the moral here is the more protons we have, the more electrons we have, the more electrons we have, the more targets we have. Can we create an x-ray photon out here? Knock that one out. Would that give us an x-ray photon? Yes. Would it be characteristic? Yes, it's still characteristic of the tungsten atom, right? Now, the only one that we graph and the only one that we mention are the, the inner shell electrons and their interaction. But we can create some pretty good X-ray photons outside of the inner shell. Okay, we'll talk about those and why it is we don't recognize any of the other ones. I'm not real sure. You know, um, I don't know. I don't know. So. Um, we use the, the tungsten atom because it's got a big nucleus, so that we get a, a lot of good interaction, especially for atoms, but certainly with characteristic as well. Can we use something else and it be better? Absolutely. Could we use lead? Lead has a higher atomic number than tungsten. Would it make this whole process better? Hmm? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it absolutely would. But what's the problem with lead? It'll melt. Yeah, yeah, one exposure, your tube is done. Right? So, this is important. But also, if we don't have that high heat capacity, then, you know, it, it, it's totally useless to us. So, we have to have both. We have to have both of those characteristics. It has to have a, a high atomic number, so we have a lot of targets, and we have a big nucleus of, for the ultimate target to create these X-ray photons, but it also has to sustain that high heat. So it has a high melting uh, point, and it's also a good conductor so that we can take all that heat and not concentrate it in a small area and spread it out over a much larger area. Okay. We're not going to get through uh, anode uh, because we still have to, to really kind of dial in focal spot and um, you know the uh, anode yield effect and talk a little bit more about the uh, long focal spectrum. So we're going to pull up there. We'll finish up on Wednesday while I'm test on Friday. Okay. So any questions on the rest of that?
Yeah.